morning. Um, very excited to be here to talk to you today about what we've been doing at Nielsen. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank Databricks and the Spark community for having us come out and talk to you guys. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so who is Nielsen? Uh, Nielsen is one of the world's largest market research firms. Um, we have a presence in over 100 countries, and we employ about 44,000 uh, people. Um, in our data science organization, we have about 900 data scientists. Um, on the watch side, and you can see from the slide here, we've segmented our business into the uh, media side and the buy side. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you a lot about what we've been doing on the watch side. Uh, there's about 300 data scientists on the watch side and about 600 data scientists on the buy side. Um, so what do we do? Um, on the watch side, we have three main businesses. Uh, we uh, have a television business where we uh, do television ratings. We're, we're very famous in the US for those television ratings. Uh, we do radio ratings. And on our digital side, uh, we uh, have a content measurement and an ad measurement. Uh, and those are very big and growing uh, businesses. On the buy side, uh, we're monitoring uh, what people are purchasing. So we have a home scan panel. Uh, we also have a uh, retail panel where we collect point of sale data from uh, retailers. Um, and then uh, our, one of our newest products is uh, e-commerce. And of course, that's growing. Uh -huh. But from, from this slide here, you can see that there's a lot of data being collected. And uh, that poses uh, quite a few challenges for us. Um, the big thing, and, and Nielsen's been around for a long time, over 80 years. Uh, we, we have some code that's still around from back in the 70s. Um, but uh, Nielsen has been known for uh, their panels and having very good representative panels. And panels are great because it's not a lot of data. Um, so to give you an example of one of our panels in the TV side in the US, we have about uh, 30,000 households that we're monitoring and collecting tuning and viewing data from. Um, but, you know, we're all moving to this big data, and um, for that television measurement in 2018, we're expanding that 30,000 household uh, to uh, 14 million households. Um, so the, the, that's great. You know, it means that we're going to have more data, we'll have, we'll have a better measurement. Um, but the challenge there is that none of our systems were set up to handle that big data. Um, the other thing that we had to do uh, this past year and a half or so was to try to get our people's skills up to, up to snuff, right? So um, they're all very smart statisticians and demographers and, and samplers, uh, but they're not used to working with that, those large data sets. So that was, you know, a bit of a challenge for us to get everybody's skills up to speed. Um, and then even worse was uh, we, were, uh, we had a lot of old equipment. Um, it's not unusual uh, to find 10-year-old servers. Uh, we, we saw people that are running JCL. Uh, we have uh, a mainframe. We have Solaris boxes. Um, and then we're very highly dependent on SaaS. So, um, that, you know, again, nothing that, that there's anything wrong with SaaS, but uh, as an organization, we decided not to uh, take SaaS into our, our next generation of, of you know, technology. We're, we weren't going to invest more into SaaS. So uh, early last year, we got together and we figured out how do we change uh, the data science organization? Um, and we, we, like I said earlier, we started with the watch side. Uh, there was a little bit, um, you know, it was a little bit easier for us. We'd already started to move to the cloud uh, on Amazon. Um, but what we decided to do was we, first we had to get everybody off of SaaS. So we had to pick a language to get everybody up to speed on, and, and we chose Python. Um, the other thing which was great uh, was that we already had a lot of uh, SQL skills. So the transition from SQL to Spark SQL was pretty seamless. Um, we knew we wanted to start to take advantage of the cloud. Uh, we did uh, 
some investment in you know, trying to figure out how we could do some clustered computing, uh, get some data access, that type of thing. Uh, in the past, we'd had stuff, flat files on mainframes. We'd have uh, different Oracle databases, NetTeza databases, and so forth. Um, everybody pretty much worked in silos, so we wanted a, a solution that uh, would help foster collaboration. Um, and then the biggest thing that we were struggling with was uh, attracting talent. Um, it was hard to find somebody off the street that new SaaS, right? So we didn't have people who were graduating college that we could uh, recruit in and say, hey, can you just write some JCL to run some mainframe SaaS? It, it just wasn't working for us. So uh, we got together. Uh, we started to, to meet with Databricks. Uh, we knew Spark was something that we wanted to invest in. Um, and this is a pretty, pretty simple technology stack. And, it's kind of nice, you know, it's not complicated, um, but we were very lucky uh, in the fall of last year that uh, we started to um, bring up a data lake at the same time. So as we were uh, starting to work with Databricks and, and bring up the Databricks environment, uh, we were able to uh, connect that to our data lake. Uh, so that was really helpful because like I said before, uh, it was difficult to get data. Data, you know, was all you know all over the place. So, uh, using our Python, our new Python skills, and Spark SQL, we were able to connect up to the data lake, um, and and that had a lot of benefits for us. Um, we also are you know using some S3 storage for some of our custom stuff. So here's the fun stuff, right? So we, we, we got all that up and running. Um, we, uh, there was a lot of things that we wanted to experiment with and, and try. Um, the, uh, some of the things that we did find uh, was that uh, the Databricks notebook uh, was a good platform for our people to transition from PC SaaS and, and mainframe SaaS. Uh, the way you can work with the cells uh, being able to uh, move in and out of different languages like Scala and Python and SQL uh, was very helpful. Um, you know, and that, you know, that's not to be undersold because I think one of the things that we ran into uh, at Nielsen was that uh, it wasn't, we, our uh, data scientists have a, a wide range. Uh, there's a lot of people that I work with, my colleagues that have been with the company 30 and 40 years. Uh, so we don't want to lose that subject matter expertise. Uh, we also had people we were just hiring in that had, had Python and R skills. But so we had to try to figure out a way to get everybody elevated at the same time. Um, this also is, you know, extremely beneficial because we could start collaborating a little bit better. We didn't have people that were working in silos, you know. So one person was writing in R and another person was writing in SAS. Uh, and then trying to swap code was, was difficult. Um, so that was extremely uh, successful for us to be able to start to use the, the Python uh, notebooks. Um, so the next item was talking about our infrastructure. So you heard me talk about the mainframes, you heard me talk about Solaris, yeah. Last night when we were at dinner, everybody was telling me, you should open with a joke. And, um, I'm not going to tell you a joke, uh, but one of my colleagues said to me, he says, just tell him that Nielsen's data science is running on, on uh, SAS on a Solaris box. That, that should be pretty funny. Uh, um, so one of the things um, that's been extremely helpful for us is to have that scalability in the cloud, right? Uh, and, and Databricks, uh, you know, when I was trying to get things back in 2016 uh, provisioned, um, I think uh, one of the worst things you can hear uh, when you're trying to get something uh, from the organization was you have to open a ticket, right? How many people have heard that you had to open a help desk ticket to get uh, some equipment or something like that? So um, just to give you an example of how frustrating that is um, for us, uh, back, we wanted to do some stuff with RPD data. 
Um, I have a slide here in a minute, and I'll, I'll show you that we can talk about the performance times before and after. But in order to run that um, model, I needed to provision an extra terabyte on a Solaris box. And I had to open up a ticket, which was great. Um, six months later, I got my one terabyte, and it costed me about $8,000 to do that. So that was extremely frustrating. So we had we have no flexibility within the data science organization to be able to do the things that we needed to do and do it quickly. Um, so with the cloud, and you know how easy it is to you know provision a uh, a uh, a cluster now with using the uh, Databricks environment, um, you know it's like night and day for us. Um, you know it's it's kind of unheard of. Uh, for us to be able to, to have something up and running in five minutes. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's the case now. And, and it's exciting to see that excitement from your colleagues um, when you're able to say, hey, yeah, you need something, it'll, it'll be up in, in 10 minutes and, and you're off to the races and we can bring it down when it's done. Um, this other, the other, this last point here really gets back to the, the it was a nice, conversation yesterday about data lakes and, and data warehouses uh, that I enjoyed. Uh, I think ours is kind of like a data swamp a little bit, but, um, but when we brought the data lake up with uh, Databricks, uh, we started to democratize data. And it's kind of, you know, ultimately, um, one of the things that we struggled with was uh, I had to go pull, you know, connect up to an Oracle database to get some data. I'd go to a NetEza box to get some data, and, and then I might get a flat file from someplace. And to be able to try to work with that um, and then do methodology development was uh, extremely difficult for us. Um, you know, it was, it's frustrating. Uh, and I think, again, you know, turning back to another slide that, you know, we talked, we saw yesterday uh, with the Hotels.com people, you know, you noticed there was a pie chart there that said how much time data scientists spend um, trying to do data cleansing. Uh, well, that's very true for us as well. Uh, but with this platform and, and now having the data lake tied into the Databricks environment, uh, it's, now it's just a matter of writing some SQL code to be able to pull everything together, and we can actually start doing methodology development. So um, I'm going to jump to the bottom here. Right now, um, we have about 156 uh, users. So again, going back to the beginning of my presentation, we, we have about 300 data scientists within Watch Data Science, and about over half of them now have access to Databricks. Uh, probably more than that, I proved a few more uh, IDs last night, uh, so that number keeps growing. Um, and everybody's excited. I, I can't tell you um, the excitement that we have of people being able to jump in uh, start playing, um, and we've had some real successes with this. So we started down our Databricks journey back in November. Um, one of the things we were able to do last year was to, because of our commitment to Python and to Databricks was we were able to reduce our SAS footprint by 40% in the watch data science area. Uh, so we don't see a lot of people still playing in SAS anymore. Uh, so that an investment saved us about $2 million uh, last year. It was good. I guess maybe it talks a little bit about how expensive SAS is. You know, it's, it's not that many people, but it is expensive. Um, one of the first uh, models that we uh, put through the Databricks uh, runner, I guess, was we have a viewer assignment model that uh, models uh, viewing from tuning. It's a, a probability-based model, and it's, it's complicated. It's been five years in development. Um, but when we, when we would run that model, um, and we had a, a use case where a client wanted to see what the data would look like uh, prior, for us, prior to us releasing it, uh, we had to run 20 markets in the U.S., so that's you know, t like 20 cities worth of data. And we measure over a month, so it's 28 days. So 20 times 28, and so that's how many times we'd have to run that model. Um, on our old SAS Solaris box, if you remember, I had to provision an extra terabyte to be able to run that. Um, it would take 
literally 36 days of processing time for us to be able to get some sort of result so that we could do a ratings analysis for our client. Um, we recently did the same thing uh, on Databricks and, and making use of the clustered computing and parallelization. We're able to run that exact same use case in four hours. And that's huge. Uh, and it kind of uh, moves into the uh, second point here. Uh, and that's uh, talking about how these run, you know, these reduced run times are, are benefiting us. Um, so on our, uh, digi in our digital uh, products, uh, we do a cookie classification uh, process. So our meters collect cookies and, and we have a way of being able to do classification. And today that's all done manually. Yeah, it's kind of sad, but um, you know, we did develop a machine learning model to do it. And we were able to apply that machine learning model to get a 20% improvement in accuracy. So, you know, that, so that's great, right? We were able to improve our methodology. Uh, but the, the real story behind that is, you know, as we're developing methodologies, um, methodology development, for us at least, is a very iterative process, right? Sometimes it's trial and error, and, and you're just trying to shoot in the dark. Try, let's try this. Let's see what it looks like. Let's try this. Let's see what it looks like. Uh, back in the day when I was working on the viewer assignment model, it was funny because we would do that iterative process where we would try to execute uh, something. And I think a random number generator actually uh, was better than some of our early models than on the viewer assignment side. But it's that iterative process that we have to do as data scientists to come up with the right methodology. And that's, you know, if it's taking 36 days for you to execute or iterate through uh, a trial of a methodology, it's, you know, that's tough. It's hard to get products out to the, the marketplace. Um, if you're able to do it in four hours, right, now you can iterate through multiple times and you can, uh, you can get better results. And that's what we're seeing across the board with our methodologies is that uh, we're able to develop faster and we're, we're coming up with better models because we have more time to play with it. Uh, a lot of times the business is driving our timelines. And so sometimes we have to just get something out to the marketplace and it's not, a, not, not the best thing. But uh, now with the, with the Databricks platform, uh, we're able to do that much better and, and quicker. So, um, so, you know, that's our story. I mean, I think our Databricks journey is, is continuing. Um, we're planning on rolling out Databricks to our buy organization in the upcoming year. So there'll be uh, another 600 people that will get added on to there. Um, you know, we're still rolling it out on the watch side, but we, by the end of the year, we fully expect to have everybody up and running on Databricks. Um, later today at 2 o'clock, uh, my colleague, Matt uh, Van Landegem, is going to do a, a presentation, so I hope you attend that. Uh, he's going to be talking about uh, one of our digital methodologies um, and kind of doing a deeper dive into it and, and, you know, talking a little bit about how we were able to uh, benefit from, from Databricks as we were developing that methodology. So, thank you.